So, let's go ahead and introduce our guest speaker before we go. So, Mike is an evangelist for Unique Technologies, where he develops and delivers recorded live. Oh, you're reading my bio. I'm reading your bio. <laughs> just like you said. Um, so he's an experienced game developer, a university educator, and uh, he is rumored to have written a book called Unity Game Development in 24 Hours. He is a gamer at heart, and Mike works to make game development fun and accessible for all skill sets. <laughs> Mike was once set on fire and has over a million internet points. It's also true. Yeah. Was this purposely set on fire? I have to know. No. No, accidental. Someone threw a can of gasoline into a firehouse standing next to it. It's a whole other story. But <laughs> yes. stop drop and roll does not work if gasoline, gasoline is involved. <laughs> That's not cool. <laughs> yeah, no, it wasn't so much. Mark here says that's an immersive experience. <laughs> that's certainly, uh, certainly a very visceral experience. <laughs> well, we're, we're thankful to have you tonight. <coughs> Oh, all right, thank you very much. I, uh, I'm a little disappointed about how many people didn't go get pizza. Right? Like, all that empty, non-pizza filled space. But I guess that's your prerogative. Hmm. So my name is Mike Gag. I'm, a, a, I guess, a, a technical evangelist at Unity Technologies. And tonight we're going to be talking about, uh, obviously, VR, right? That seems apropos. Uh, but, you know, because I knew that we have a bit of a mixed audience, we're going to talk a little bit about like design and theory and stuff like that, and we're gonna also see some examples and some kind of behind the scenes and how stuff is put together and all that. So, real quick, a show of hands, you know, who here has has been in a VR experience, has tried VR at all, right? I would assume most, but you never really know, right? And uh, for anyone who hasn't, or even who has after this, you're welcome to come on up and play. I got a bunch of games installed and stuff like that. Um, so, who here has developed any virtual reality experiences? A couple, fantastic. Uh, have anyone here make any games? Fantastic, all right. And then, uh, anyone here uh, use the Unity game engine? Who here has never heard of Unity game engine? All right, fair enough, right on. Okay, so we're going to be talking a little bit about just uh, VR in general, and then we're going to kind of see what Unity is. I'm not in sales. This isn't a sales page. It's just what, right? Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit, for starters, uh, about the scumbag brain, the science behind VR. I hate using the term neuroscience. I was like, I should say neuroscience, but then neuroscientists come and go, well, actually, <laughs> and, do that, and so I don't do that anymore. Uh, ignore the, the Shanghai in the lower left. These are the slides I used in Shanghai, so I didn't bother changing the template. Um, all right, so what I'm going to kind of focus on talking about is a few things here. So first off, you know, why do we get motion sick, right? Not just motion aware, but motion sickness. What is that sickness? Where does that come from within the context of virtual reality, augmented reality? Um, also, this concept of immersion or presence, um, we hear a whole lot of, uh, yeah, come on in. Uh, we hear a whole lot of recently. It's not a new concept, but people think it's new because it's really surfaced again in the, the age of VR. Everyone's kind of congratulating themselves for coming with a new concept that is a thousand or so years old. Uh, and then, what is depth sensation? Right? This another thing that's part of VR. This thing that we experience as humans that a lot of people don't know about and greatly affects our experiences in how we perceive things. All right. So when we talk about motion sickness, the fact of the matter is about 40% of people still get nauseous when they use VR. And so the question becomes, you know, why do they get sick, right? Now obviously, you know, something moves weird or whatever, they, they feel ill, but why ill? Why, why that sensation? Why not just go, oh, this doesn't look right, this doesn't seem right, why actually physically ill, all right? So why do we get motion sick? And the answer is mushrooms, all right? Um, <laughs> uh, so mushrooms are the answer. And allow me to explain, all right? So for uh, simplicity's sake, uh, when we're talking about our brain, our brain has two parts, all right? So we have the green part, right? Which is the, the new brain, right? It's the, the newer part that's evolved more recently. It's, uh, our center for logical thought, our center for higher order emotions like love, right, commitment, 
uh, social standings, right? Uh, cheating versus being honest and honorable. These things that are really human traits, more or less, and some noble animals, but mostly human traits. Then we also have the old brain, the red part, all right? And that's the part that kept us alive for ages and ages and ages, right? That's the part that experiences raw, visceral emotions, survival instincts. That's the part that makes you breathe when you're not thinking about breathing and, and all that stuff, right? And so these are the two parts that work in conjunction. Maybe there's a third part, we're not going to talk about it, no one cares. Uh, there's, these are the two parts that really work together that sculpt our experiences, our everyday life. And so, yeah, we've got the new brain, we've got the old brain. So when our new brain says, hey, you know, it seems like we're moving, right? Seems reasonable. Looking around, it seems like I'm moving, maybe in a car or running around shooting zombies or whatever, right? The old brain says, we aren't moving, we've been poisoned, oh my god, we're dying, evacuate all of our systems, all right? We've got to get the poison out as quickly as possible. So we get ill, we, we vomit, right? we pass out, we start shaking and get fevery and sweaty in case it's viral, right? In case it's bodily injury, we just want to fall asleep, hit the ground, and just, just shut down completely so whatever is damaging us will stop damaging us, right? And that is the old part of our brain doing that to us, and that's why we get sick. That's where the sickness comes from, all right? That's why we're all down with the sickness. Um, our brains are based on this concept of a negative feedback loop. All right, this negative feedback loop. And this, as someone who's crafting a VR experience, even if it's not necessarily a game, right? Maybe it's just in your work environment, maybe it's a, for business, medical, construction, whatever, right? we're dealing with this concept of a negative feedback loop. We only notice the things that are wrong and we work to correct them. We don't notice the things that are right. Good experiences don't make us the opposite of sick. Don't make us feel superhuman, right? We only just get sick if something is negative, right? We only notice the things that are wrong. Right? So for instance, you wouldn't notice the temperature of this room unless it was too hot or too cold. Right? Chances are uh, you haven't noticed the sensation of the socks on your toes until I just said that right now. And now you're all thinking about the socks on your toes if you're wearing socks. And if you're not, you're thinking, oh, I'm not wearing socks. Right? These are things you wouldn't notice otherwise because there's nothing wrong with it. Right? Because it's not wrong, you don't notice it. And so that's what we have to work with. We have to avoid this negative feedback loop. We have to avoid things that are going to trigger these negative responses that your brain wants to uh, solve, these unsettling stimuli. So what are some examples? So we have acceleration, all right? Human body does not handle acceleration well at all, all right? And that's not even in VR. That can be just in movies. That can be people who get car sick. <coughs> who gets car sick? I get car sick. Oh man, do I get car sick. I actually get super VR motion sick too. I'm like the poster child for VR uh, motion sickness. Uh, a game has to be done incredibly well or else I'm immediately sick. Always, right? Which is funny because I do VR all the time. So I just basically spent most of my life completely ill. Um, it's great. But, but, you know, humans, we can't sense velocity, right? It's, you know, we can't sense that we're moving. You're sitting in a car, and you know if you're not accelerating, you can't feel it, all right? Most of us think we're standing still right now, well, except for the few who are walking. But all of you are sitting, think I'm I'm sitting still, but you're not, because the Earth is rotating at a thousand miles per hour, and we're hurtling through the Milky Way, and the Milky Way is hurtling through the universe at trillions of miles an hour. That's how fast you're going right now. You can't feel it, right? Because we don't feel velocity. Acceleration is a problem, though. So in VR, we avoid acceleration, right? If I need to move somewhere, I move somewhere instantly, right? Usually with a flash or whatever, I teleport, right? But any time that I actually traverse the space in between, where I go from standing still to <coughs> having a velocity, that requires acceleration, and I'm going to notice that I didn't accelerate, and that's going to make me ill, right? So I'm either at full velocity the whole time, I'm standing still the whole time, or I'm instantaneously teleporting, and that's going to make things work a lot better for me. Um, you can also have acceleration velocity if things are very far away, and there's a lot of rules to it, but for the most part, if you want to have 100% no one's getting ill, right, you allow them to control their own motion, you don't have any acceleration. All right. We also avoid primal stimuli, things like excessive heights, things that are going to make people freak out. Unless your point is to make people freak out, then you know, have fun with that, right? Like, the, anyone play the cat elevator game? No? Well, let me, let me set the stage for you. Basically, there's a board that sits on the ground, put on the VR, it's like a real board. 
and uh, you put on your headset, and you're in an elevator, and you're going up, and the floor is, and the door opens, and there's a tiny catwalk and a cat at the end of it. You've got to go and walk on the board to get to the cat. People lose their minds in this awesome <laughs> way, right? I mean, then you know, you know you're in this room, and that's just a piece of wood that you put on the floor, but it doesn't matter. Right? Because um, the old part of your brain wins that argument every time. Its purpose is to go, is that a lie? Yes, it is. Let's freak out. Right? That's its point. That's why it exists. So um, it can make people really, really panic. And it sounds funny, but it can also be really dangerous. At the GBC Game Developer Conference this year, um, the people who make the movie Paranormal Activities was unveiling their new VR experience, a scary game experience. The, uh, the EMTs, the paramedics, were called like six or seven times. Uh, over the course of that conference, as people collapsed, punched other people, ran full on into walls, uh, just thrashed about, uh, got really injured. So, you know, primal responses are primal responses. There's not a lot you're going to do about that, except maybe just avoid the things that will trigger those. We also avoid very fast or very close objects, because that just makes people uncomfortable. No one likes this. Right? Just no one enjoys this sensation at all. Right? And we also avoid fast moving or close moving peripheral objects because your brain immediately goes, it's an eagle, you're going to die, or it's a lion, you're going to die, right? So we avoid those things, these unsettling stimuli, which can make you sick almost instantly. All right. But there's some really good news about this, right? So our old brain is stupid. It's dumb. It's made of mud, right? That Our old brain is really, really bad at anything except for keeping us alive, right? It's really good at that, right? As a testament that we're still here. But uh, it's really easy to trick. As long as we don't startle the old brain, so as we don't do anything that's like uncomfortable, right? We can get it to believe anything. It has to. That's how we stay alive, right? A friend pops up, you ah, and you punch him in the face. It's because if that was someone trying to stab you, punching them in the face would have been the right thing to do, and you can't risk it, right? That's what the old brain does for us. So it wants to believe anything, right? And so we can trick it into believing anything, which makes our experiences really, really cool, all right? Here's an example. I want you all to close your eyes and count how many rooms were in, are in your home. All close your eyes, except for Mr. Bean. So you all got the number? Yeah. Okay. So chances are, if you're still counting, good for you. Uh, <laughs> chances are, if when you close your eyes to count, you either walked through each of your rooms or floated above your house and looked at your house like blueprints and counted the rooms that way. Right? Does that seem about right to what most people do? Right? Yeah. And so here's what's really, really neat about that. Just now, right, when you closed your eyes and counted rooms in your home, I gave you an experience that most of your brain thought was real. Most of you, most of your brain, most of what makes you you, thought you were at your home. Even flying above it or walking through it, it didn't know. Right? It's very, very easy to trick because our brain is built like this. All right? These input loop centers. So we have our sensory organs, right? Our eyes, our, our taste buds, our ears, you know, sense of touch, all that feeds into these sensory nerves in our brain. And our sensory nerves go to these receiving centers, and that says processing, even though there's a sensor in the way there. So it goes to this receiving center, the receiving center says, okay, the raw data, let me send it into this constant CPU in your brain that's just processing data, and you, you process those experiences. You know, I pick up this bottle, I'm feeling this bottle, whatever. But if I put this down and I just go like this and think about thinking of the bottle, my brain still thinks I'm holding it. Because the memory banks, you're remembering how things taste, how they smell, how they look, something that happened, feeds into the same receiving centers. So from the receiving centers into the processing centers, they have no idea where that data is coming from. Most of your brain doesn't know. All right? A very small amount of your brain actually knows if I'm actually holding that bottle or remembering holding that bottle. Which is why, if I stood here like this long enough, I would forget and think that I actually had it and go, oh, where'd it go, right? Even though I've not been here the entire time, right? We can trick our brains. That's why when you think of your favorite meal, you start salivating and all that stuff. Because your body thinks it's actually there and you're getting ready for it, right? Um, so that's these feedback loops. It's really, really cool, right? And using this, I can give people real experiences, right? Because if I can trick your brain into thinking it's real, you really did experience it which is really cool, all right? This is the process that we call immersion, flow, presence, these terms that we hear, being in the zone. You ever been at work and like, man, I'm in the zone, right? I'm getting so much done, I'm crunching it. What is that? What is that immersion, right? What is happening during that? 
all right? And the fact of the matter is, is immersion works based on how we can kind of trick the brain into just getting out of its own way. Our brain is diametrically opposed, the old brain and the new brain. The old brain wants to process things fast. The old brain is like your GPU and your computer. It churns a thousand times faster than the new brain. It just processes data massively fast. But as a result, it's stupid. It believes everything and just goes, this is real, this is real, this is real. And the new brain is set up to oppose that. You go, no, it's not, no, it's not, no, it's not. Right? And so most of the time you're struggling with yourself, trying to get in that zone, that's your old brain and your new brain it's fighting each other. Right? The new brain acts like uh, someone who works on an assembly line whose job it is to look at each thing and go, that's good, that's bad, that's real, that's not. Every conscious thought that comes through the new brain is going, that really happened, that one didn't happen, that was a memory, that really happened. Right? When you see the scary movie and the guy pulls out an axe, the new brain goes, this is just a movie. You're just watching The Abyss. Don't forget to breathe. Everyone forgets to breathe when they watch The Abyss, right? Because <laughs> if the new part of your brain goes to sleep, right, just kind of shuts down for a bit, then it's party time for the old brain, watching The Abyss going, we're underwater. We shouldn't breathe or we'll breathe in water and die, right? And the new brain's just like, well, yeah, yeah, that sounds good, <laughs> right? So we want to get the new part of our brain to just sort of shut down. That is putting people into presence immersion flow, right? That's what we're trying to do, right? It's actually really easy to do. So the new part of our brain isn't as fast as the old part of our brain. Because it's not as fast, it can't process everything. And so all we have to do is say, nothing to see here, new brain. Don't pay attention to this. There are other things more important to check out. Just ignore this. So the new part of your brain is actually pretty easy to bypass, right? So, and we see these all the time, optical illusions, right? You might assume, yeah, that woman's on a flying board. But until you notice that the shadow is just the shadow of a flag. But until you notice the shadow is the shadow of a flag, you think that's completely reasonable. Flying boards in the desert. I've seen that movie a hundred times, whatever. <laughs> right? And then you're like, oh, that wasn't, yeah, that was a shadow. Right? And then, okay. So as long as we don't give the new part of the brain anything to really notice, we can trick it into believing just about anything because it's got more important things to do constantly preventing us from punching people just in case they might want to stab us, right? That's what most of our brain does every day. You ever have those thoughts? You think, man, if anyone knew I had that thought, I'd go to jail. Like, how horrible is that? That's your old brain going, they're going to stab you eventually. Just take them out now. <laughs> your brain goes, oh, I don't think we should do that. That's not a good idea. And then you think, well, that was a terrible thought. We all have that. It keeps us alive, all right? Um, it's just one of those things, right? You're all terrible people. <laughs> um, so, how do we make it easier for players to experience immersion? How do we make it easier for them to get into this flow? And again, when I say player, I talk mostly to video game people, but we do a lot of, I do a lot of talks for, you know, architectural firms and medical and libraries and offshore oil rigs and stuff. So when I say players, I really just mean anybody, right? Anyone who's experiencing VR, because the fact of the matter is, is while you're in the state of immersion, <coughs> even if what you're doing is like work-related, training, whatever, your brain's recording it as real activity, and you remember it as such, right? If I were to sit down right now, and you were to come up and tell me 100 facts about George Washington, I would remember none of it, except that he had wooden teeth, but that's not actually true, right? But, in a VR simulation, if I'm in a classroom and a giant blue whale comes up and says, you want to hear about George Washington? I'm going to say, hell yeah, I want to hear about George Washington, and I'm going to learn, because it's going to be writing directly into my brain is a real experience. I'm not going to be thinking, hey, remember that time I played the game with the whale? I'm going to be thinking, remember that time when a whale was talking to me and telling me about George Washington? That's completely normal, and I remember everything that whale said, right? So we want this state of immersion even if we're not making games. So how do we do it? Um, and we do that through a concept called AI. Who knows what AI is? Go ahead. That's, that's my gesture for yes, say it. Artificial intelligence. No, I'm taking that phrase back. <laughs> AI stands for artificial imagination. All right, this is a concept of trying to coin. It's not going so well uh, because apparently artificial intelligence has been around for a while. Artificial imagination. So let's think about this. Let's let's think about how uh, the imagination plays an important role in how we learn and experience. Right. So let's think about daydreaming. Right. Some of us still daydream, uh, all, all, all of us daydreamed a lot when we were kids, it gets harder when you're older, whatever. Daydreaming is, you know, when you just sort of let your mind go and all these little fantasies and whatever, it's really hard to get into that daydream zone 
And it's really easy to be brought out of it, right? Any noise, any, so when, oh, hey, you knew, oh, what, are you right? It's easy to come out of daydreaming because your brain does all of the work, all of the imagination, all of the process. You, you imagine all the people, the places, what's happening, everything about it. That's a lot of effort. It's easy to snap you out of it, right? Easy to make the new part of your brain go, oh, wait a minute, no, that's not real. Okay, let me come back to reality. Then we think about reading, all right? Again, reading uh, is easier than daydreaming because the, the words are there. They're telling us what's happening. But we're still providing all the sounds, the sights, the smells, like everything about it, which again means it's easy to get pulled out of it. It's harder to be in it, it's easy to get pulled out of it. Some people can't read if there's too much distraction, right? Just, oh, I'm trying to read, right? Because again, it's hard to get into that state of immersion when you're reading, because you're still putting in so much effort. Then you have TV. TV is telling you the sights and the sounds and what's happening. All you do is maybe provide like the, the smells and the touches or whatever, um, but you're just sitting there and you're just kind of just brain dead watching, right? And TV and movies, and it, it's easier to get in. You can binge watch a show for 8, 10, 12 hours and go, oh man, where did my Sunday go? Right? Oh, it's Tuesday. Oh shit, I'm going to get fired. Um, <laughs> it's much easier to, to get into because your brain does so much less work, right? But there's still the problem with TV where you're like, oh, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't do this, right? So then you get video games. And video games gives you agency. Agency is a term that means you control what happens. So now, I'm being told what I see, what I experience, what's happening, but I get to tell it what I want to do. And no better way to really emphasize artificial imagination than to say, what are you doing right now? I'm chopping down this tree. No, you're not. You're hitting a plastic button against another plastic button, and it's sending an electric signal through a cord, or wirelessly if you've got one of those newfangled consoles, right? And it's telling you what happened as a result of you pressing this plastic button. That's what you're doing, right? But the system is, is imagining everything for you and it's putting you into this world, right? And that's where you get those amazing experiences. And VR builds upon that even, because even with video games, even when you're totally into it, your brain has this tendency to do something called framing, where your eyes just do this, just randomly, to go, oh, it's not real. Right? Oh, that's a wall. That's just a TV screen. Okay, I'm out of it. Right? In VR, you can't do that. It's all the way around you. Right? And so you have agency. You get to choose what you're looking at. You get to choose where you go, what you do. Or you have full control. Right? Super easy to get in and stay in. So there's a lot of power there. Right? It's very easy to turn off the, the new brain and let the old brain just sort of have a part of it. Right? And that's this artificial imagination. Let's let the system tell you the results of your actions. So you don't even have to come up with that. And you, it's like living life. That's what life does, right? If I hit that bottle, I don't need to imagine what's going to happen. Life will make the bottle move and tell me what happened. And I go, oh, that was interesting. We're in a state of artificial imagination with real life, right? though it's not artificial, right? it's just life, right? But games, and specifically VR, are that way. Right? So here's how we, we do this, how we provide this artificial imagination. All right? We need to keep the new brain asleep. And what that means is we don't give it anything to notice, anything that's just out of the ordinary, anything that we would make it wake up. All right? And so what we want to do is, I know, and, and this, this guy's mad, this is actually quite apropos, right? Um, so we talk about knowing where we are in VR space. Well, the most common way right now is this concept of chaperones. So I walk close to a wall, 